And even though Jesse is now here with us, the staff has done a great job, which is a testament to his leadership. Now I am thrilled to introduce you to our keynote speaker. Mr. Martin Grunberg is the acting chair of the FDIC Board of Directors. He has been in the senior leadership of FDIC for most of the past two decades and involved in shaping public policy on banking since 1980s. If you remember the 80s. I know we got a lot of young people here. So please, let me give a warm Just Economy welcome to Martin Grunberg. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Man, I have not seen a crowd like this in a long time. So ni nice to see you all, and nice to see you all gathered for an occasion like this one. And let me begin, first of all, by thanking you all and the leadership of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition for inviting me to speak with you all today. For over 30 years, NCRC has been a powerful advocate for expanded access to credit, investment, and basic banking services for low and moderate income communities across the United States. Your 600 grassroots member organizations have been a critically important voice for those communities. In particular, and relevant to my comments today, there has been no more important supporter of the Community Reinvestment Act than NCRC over this past 30 years. The continued importance and impact of CRA today is in considerable measure a result of your sustained commitment. Now, before I proceed further, if I may, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge John Taylor, the founding leader of NCRC. I believe this is the first NCRC conference since John retired last August, and I understand he is being presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award this evening. I've known John since the beginning of NCRC. His vision, passion, and dedication laid the foundation for NCRC's success. And that leadership is now being able, ably carried forward by Jesse Van Toll. And I very much regret that Jesse can't be with us here today. But I, I did want to take this opportunity to thank John Taylor for his lifelong commitment to social justice. This is a life that truly made a difference. Now, as Katie indicated, the federal banking agencies recently released a notice of proposed rulemaking on the Community Reinvestment Act. I want you to know we timed it so it would be a nice lead-in for your conference today. So glad. Glad to be helpful. But I, I want to focus my remarks today on that NPR, which was adopted on May 5th by the three banking agencies. This joint NPR, as you know, has been a long time coming. The last major revision of the rule implementing CRA occurred in 1995. That's over 25 years ago. 
A lot has changed in the banking industry during that time. It was imperative for the federal banking agencies to take up the challenge of, adopt of adapting CRA in a way that responds to those changes and strengthens its impact. And I know after I speak here today, you're going to see a video with my colleagues, uh, Vice Chair Brainerd from the Federal Reserve and Acting Comptroller Sue from the OCC. And I want to underscore the cooperative and collegial effort to produce this NPR. The three agencies are very much together in putting forward this important proposal. Now, the Community Reinvestment Act seeks to address one of the most intractable challenges of our financial markets, access to credit, investment, and basic banking services for low and moderate income communities, both urban and rural. As you well know, CRA was a response to the redlining practices of government housing programs and private sector lending institutions that denied credit to neighborhoods with poorer households and large minority populations. The provisions of CRA, as originally enacted in 1977, were deceptively simple but they were groundbreaking. The key provision of the Act states, and I quote, in connection with this examination of a financial institution, the appropriate federal financial supervisory agency shall assess the institution's record of meeting the credit needs of its entire community, including low and moderate income neighborhoods, close quote. Since its enactment, CRA has become the foundation of responsible finance for low and moderate income communities in the United States. And the NPR approved by the federal banking agencies on May 5th would significantly expand the scope and rigor of CRA and assure its continued relevance for the next generation. Now, I have to tell you that there is a lot in this NPR. It's a complex and detailed document. But in my remarks today, I would like to highlight 10, 10 important provisions of the proposed rule that we believe will significantly strengthen and enhance the effectiveness of CRA. So this is my top 10 list, if you will, and I'm going to go through them 1 to 10. So first, the NPR would establish new retail lending assessment areas to allow for CRA evaluation in communities where a bank may be engaging in significant lending activity but where the bank does not have a branch. As you know, currently, CRA assessment areas are tied to bank branches. Bank lending in communities in which the bank does not have a physical presence is generally not subject to CRA. While bank branches continue to play a critical role in serving communities, technology has made possible an increasing proportion of bank lending activity unrelated to the branch network. Some banks have only one branch or no branch at all, yet engage in large-scale lending across a broad geographic area. These new retail lending assessment areas are a means of subjecting that lending activity to a CRA review regardless, regardless of the business model of the bank. And I can't underscore 
the importance, sufficiently the importance of that provision. The retail lending test under the NPR would require an evaluation of mortgage and small business lending, and for banks with more than $10 billion in assets, auto lending as well. The first time CRA would be expanded to include consumer lending. These new retail lending assessment areas represent a critically important adaptation of CRA to the changing nature of the banking business. And it's worth noting that in addition to the branch-based assessment areas and the new retail lending assessment areas, a bank would also be subject to a statewide test to capture areas not included in the other two, as well as a multi-state MSA review and an institution-wide review. The objective here is to subject all, all of the bank's lending activity to a CRA evaluation in a way that has not been done before. So that's number one. Now, number two, the NPR would raise the bar for CRA performance on the retail lending test in order for a bank to earn an outstanding or high satisfactory rating. The NPR incorporates detailed metrics on bank lending activity. As a result, the NPR is able to establish standards for bank performance to achieve a particular CRA rating that would be higher than past experience. The objective is to provide an incentive for increased bank lending to underserved communities. So let me just say, at its very core, this notice of proposed rulemaking is about expanding the reach of CRA to all communities served by the bank and to raise the bar for performance in all of those communities. Now, third, the proposal would provide for greater clarity, consistency, and transparency in the CRA evaluation and compliance process for all stakeholders, banks, and community organizations. One way the proposal would accomplish this is by adopting a, metri a metrics-based approach to CRA evaluations for retail lending and community development financing, which will also include public benchmarks for greater transparency, certainty, consistency, and accountability. The proposal would also more clearly define community development activities by establishing 11 proposed categories for community development, while retaining a focus on low and moderate income communities, the NPR seeks to provide stakeholders with greater certainty about what activities qualify for community development credit, including through the publication of an illustrative and non-exhaustive list of qualifying activities and through a pre-approval process. So that's number three. Now, fourth, the proposal tailors CRA evaluations and data collection to bank size, complexity, and business type. All banks are not the same, and all communities are not the same. The proposal tailors the CRA tests and data collection to each bank category, small, intermediate, and large. For instance, small banks would continue to be evaluated under the existing regulatory framework, but would have the option to be evaluated under aspects of the new proposed evaluation framework. There would be no new data collection for small or intermediate banks. 
the agency sought to leverage existing data as much as possible. For the larger banks, those over $10 billion in assets, there are additional evaluation elements and data requirements relating to deposits, community development, and auto lending. So that's four. Five. In furtherance of the agency's objective to promote transparency, the NPR would require large banks to disclose the distribution of home mortgage loan originations and applications in each of the bank's assessment areas by race and ethnicity, utilizing publicly available data under the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. The proposal is intended to provide transparent information to the public in regard to the bank's lending to communities of color. Although providing the data in this disclosure would not have an independent impact on the CRA ratings of the bank, it would allow the public to compare lending by the bank in those communities to other communities, as well as allow comparisons to other institutions. And one further point, the current CRA rule prohibits banks from drawing assessment areas that reflect illegal discrimination or arbitrarily excluding low and moderate income census tracts. That provision is retained in the proposal, but in addition and related to the issue of redlining, which precipitated the enactment of CRA, large banks would be required to include whole counties in establishing their assessment areas. This would ensure that low and moderate, that low income or minority areas will not be carved out of assessment areas. Now, sixth, and relevant to these issues, currently illegal or discriminatory credit practices are a potential basis for downgrading a bank's CRA rating. Now these criteria would be retained and expanded so that all discriminatory practices, whether or not they are tied to the provision of credit, could be a basis for possible downgrade. Such practices could be credit practices, but could also be practices related to deposit products or other products and services offered by the bank. For example, discrimination in opening deposit accounts would be covered by the proposal. Now, seventh, the NPR recognizes the importance of minority depository institutions, Treasury Department certified community development financial institutions, women's depository institutions, and low income credit unions in providing financial access to underserved consumers and communities. For example, the NPR creates a specific community development definition for eligible activities, such as investments, loan participations, and other ventures conducted by all banks with these institutions, including such activities undertaken by an MDI or WDI in cooperation with a different MDI, WDI, or low-income credit union. The proposed definition specifies that loan, investment, or service activities by any bank undertaken in connection with a Treasury Department certified CDFI would be presumed to qualify for CRA credit as community development. All community development activities conducted by banks with MDIs, CDFIs, WDIs or low-income credit unions in facility-based assessment areas, states, multi-state MSAs, and nationwide areas would get credit 
under the proposal. Community development activities that support or are conducted in partnership with an MDI, CDFI, WDI, and low-income credit union are considered particularly high impact and responsive when assessing a bank's community development activities. And the NPR specifies under the retail services and products test that retail lending focused partnerships with MDIs, CDFIs, WDIs, and low-income credit unions should be considered when assessing the responsiveness of a bank's credit products in meeting the needs of low and moderate income communities under CRA. Eighth, the new community development financing test would, be, would provide credit for lending and investment activities outside of the bank's branch-based assessment area. This will provide incentives for banks to provide community development financing in underserved areas, including rural areas and native lands, even if they are outside of their existing brick and mortar area of service. In addition, activities in areas of persistent poverty are provided additional consideration. The NPR includes provisions specific to bank lending and services in rural areas and native lands, including giving credit for loans and investments for essential community facilities like schools or healthcare facilities, essential community infrastructure like broadband, and disaster preparedness and climate resiliency activities that benefit or serve middle-income rural census tracts and native lands that are distressed or underserved. The proposed rule provides for consideration for lending to small businesses and small farms essential to rural communities. Banks that are particularly responsive to the needs of smaller businesses and smaller farms, those with gross annual revenues of less than $250,000 will receive heightened consideration for such loans. The proposed rule also provides that banks will be evaluated on their lending to these smaller businesses and smaller farms once the data is available. Of particular note, the proposed rule would provide that all bank assessment areas would be reviewed and assigned a performance conclusion, eliminating limited scope assessment area reviews. This will ensure that bank performance in rural markets is evaluated and considered as part of the ratings process. The NPR also proposes a new community development definition for activities in native land areas to recognize the unique, the unique status of na native and tribal communities and encourage bank en engagement in those communities. It, it also proposes an impact review factor for all eligible community development activities taking place in native land areas. In addition, under the Retail Services and Products tech, Test, if a bank operates branches in native land areas, it would receive positive qualitative consideration. Now, ninth, and this is important, while we know that technology has led to significant changes in the provision of bank services, bank branches continue to play a crucial role for consumers and communities. Nearly 80% nearly, nearly of mortgages continue to be originated in branch-based assessment areas. In recognition of the important role branches still play, the proposed rule would provide consideration for banks that maintain or establish a branch where there are few or no branches in LMI communities. 
The rule proposes methods for branch access that are tailored to recognize that reasonable access is different in rural areas than in urban communities. And access involves more than simply the availability of a branch. A consumer must also have access to products and services that are affordable and responsive to their needs. Expanding access to federally insured banks has been a priority for, of the FDIC. And for the first time, the NPR would evaluate for large banks the offering and usage of low-cost transaction accounts to consumers, accounts, accounts with low or no minimum balance requirements, and no overdraft fees. Now, 10th, and finally, the NPR would give credit to community development activities designed to strengthen disaster and climate resistance in low and moderate income communities, activities that mitigate the effect of disasters and climate-related risks, such as earthquakes, severe storms, droughts, flooding, and forest fires would be eligible. Examples of eligible activities would include supporting the establishment of flood control systems in a flood-prone targeted area, retrofitting affordable housing in a targeted area to withstand future disasters or climate-related events, promoting green space in lower moderate income census tracts in order to mitigate the effects of extreme heat, particularly in urban areas, financing community centers that serve as cooling or warming centers in targeted areas that are vulnerable to extreme temperatures, infrastructure to protect targeted areas from the impact of rising sea levels, and assistance to small farms in targeted areas to adapt to drought challenges. Now look, that's, that's my top 10 list. C CRA's, CRA's simple premise that banks have an affirmative obligation to serve the local communities in which they do business is as powerful and relevant today as it was in 1977. I would like to thank all of the neighborhood and community organizations and the banks and banking organizations who are here today. CRA's effectiveness, CRA's effectiveness is ultimately premised on your participation, leadership, and support. We've come a long way in 45 years. I have no doubt that we have a long way to go. As you know, and was mentioned previously, the NPR provides a 90-day comment period. Hear me on this. Comments are due by August 5th. We encourage you to review the NPR carefully and pri provide us with your thoughtful and detailed comments. We may have gotten some, gotten some things right. We may have gotten some things wrong. There may be some things we can approve. There may be some things we haven't thought of. We need your comments by August 5th, and we really urge you to respond. I would note that NCRC already released an initial analysis of the CRA NPR, which we have found very helpful. This NPR is an important opportunity to shape the future and to make CRA stronger and more effective, and we need to take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you all very much.
Well, Martin, thank you so much for being here. I have one question for you, and I think that, you know, um, with everything that's been going on, there's been a lot of discussion about racial inequities. And so, can you give us a little bit more information on how this proposed rule would address racial disparities and racial inequities? Well, thank you for the question, and um, we spend a lot of time giving thought to that issue. And as I mentioned in my remarks, um, for the first time, under this proposed rule, CRA would provide a line of sight into a bank's lending to community colors, but, but to communities of color, broken down by assessment areas, utilizing publicly available data under the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. And this will do two things. It will allow the public to see how a bank is serving communities of color in comparison to other communities in which the bank is doing business, and it will allow the public to compare the performance of that bank in communities of color to other financial institutions that are also doing business in those communities. This is a degree of transparency and, if you will, public accountability that we have not been able to provide under CRA before. And in addition, two other things of particular importance. As I noted, um, in drawing assessment areas, you cannot count part of a county. You have to include an entire county, so you cannot select one community from another within a county area. And we expand the application of discriminatory conduct under CRA, meaning discriminatory conduct under CRA would result in a downgrade. Currently, it applies only to credit products. Under this proposed rule, it would apply to all products and services offered by the bank, including deposit products. So from our standpoint, this proposed rule really makes a contribution in terms of strengthening CRA's impact in regard to serving communities of color and holding discriminatory conduct accountable. That being said, let me underscore the importance of your comments to us on this issue. We welcome them. We will review them carefully and there's still a final rulemaking to be done. So thank you all very much. I can't tell you how good it is to see you all. Glad you could all make it. See you again. Thank you so much. All right, I, I just, you know, I know you all are tired of hearing us say that you need to comment, 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 but part of the reason that those, ten, those that top 10 list was created is because we commented. And so it's really important for you to make your voices heard. Most of us are here because we represent underserved communities. Most of us are here because we're the voice for those communities. And this is your opportunity to impact policy that definitely makes a difference in those communities. So again, we've tried to make it as easy as possible for you to comment. When you leave out, before you go to your next session, if you have time, please make sure you stop in the foyer. We have a station for you to comment while you're here. It is really, really important for you all to do that work. Um, and it's, and, and it's, it's going to mean a lot to the communities that you serve. So again, Martin, thank you for your thoughts and your leadership within the FDIC. The Federal Reserve Board's Open Market Committee is meeting this week, which was unfortunate timing for us because it means that the Fed governors couldn't be here with us today. So late this week, we found time to record a conversation with Federal Reserve Vice Chair Lael Brainerd, Acting Comptroller, current Acting Comptroller of Currency Michael Tsu and NCRC CEO Jesse Van Toll. So let's watch it and then we'll follow it with a live discussion with a group of senior agency staff that are focused on CRA. And just as a reminder, we cannot hear up here when there's, where, when there's a, um, when you all are talking, and I know you all are talking very low, but if you all could really keep it to a minimum, it makes it very difficult for us to hear. So we'll transition over to the video and then we'll have our panel. Thank you.
well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks to the wonders of technology, we're able to bring you three people who otherwise wouldn't be able to participate in the conference. Um, as, as the NCRC audience knows earlier this year, the three banking regulators uh, proposed an NPR to modernize CRA. We have two of the three principals uh, with us here today, virtually, uh, Vice Chairman Lael Brainerd of the Federal Reserve and Acting Comptroller Michael Sue, Comptroller of the Currency. I um, want to thank both of you for being here today. I know it wasn't possible to be in person, but really appreciate um, the effort to be here. Uh, and, and I think you need no further introduction to our audience. So I will dive um, right in. Uh, Vice Chairman Brainerd, as, as you engaged in the CRA process, you heard from a great many stakeholders, um, from your own staff, the problems with CRA. Um, you know, what was the problem we were trying to address? What was really important to get right? And what did you hear along the way um, that needed fixing? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Jesse, for uh, holding this conversation. And thanks to uh, NCRC for all of the engagement um, of your members and your organization. One of the things that we heard uh, for a long time from some of the members of your organization, from community groups generally, and from banks, uh, that more and more banking services are taking place far from branches, via mobile, via online, and that means less and less of the activity of banks is taken into consideration for the existing CRA role, which of course it was written more than 25 years ago, so, uh, so not a surprise. So the proposal will scope in a lot more activity that will be within the umbrella of CRA evaluation, including importantly, areas where there are concentrations of retail lending activity outside of a branch and areas that are just broadly underserved uh, by banks. And I think the proposal uh, tries to make sure that the CRA role is, role is fit for purpose for the banking system of the future, uh, which in effect will make it more of an investment in the future of these uh, communities and create uh, opportunity for the way that financial services are delivered today rather than the way they were delivered 25 years ago. Thank you. And uh, Comptroller Sue, same question uh, from your perspective. Um, you know, what were the problems we were trying to solve here? Um, so uh, to echo uh, Leo, you know, thank, thanks for having uh, me and, and, and for this conference. Um, there's a saying, um, faster alone, farther together. And I, I say that because at the agency level, when I took office about a year ago, uh, I commenced a review of the OCC's 2020 rule, CRA rule and you know, sought feedback from a, from a wide range of stakeholders. And the overwhelming feedback was that the agency should work together and develop a joint rule. And, and that would make the rule uh, better substantively and more durable. And I think that that was something I heard from bankers, from, from community groups, pretty much everybody. Um, more specifically, there were some elements of that rule which were positive that, you know, again, in that kind of feedback process, and, you know, and people felt very strongly about them. You know, there was a special section on Native American communities. Um, there was, you know, people talked about the transparency of the eligible activities for community development. There's some disagreement about the exact things on that list, but the concept of having that kind of transparency to speed things up, uh, I you heard a lot about that. Um, and kind of a general embrace of a greater use of metrics, which I think is something we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, though there was lots of criticism about the exact <laughs> metrics that were picked, and how they were used, but the, the idea that you could use, take a data-driven approach and be more objective and consistent. I think these are things that were, you know, was hearing loud and clear. Um, and then I recall very early on, Jesse, we had a discussion, um, you know, I was doing outreach to various groups and you were really you know, clear about, okay, these are some priorities and concerns that we have about great inflation, about you know, a greater need uh, for consistency and performance, things like that. I heard that echoed by some of your members, by others. And so we, through the interagency process, were able to kind of bring all of that to bear uh, on, on the joint uh, proposal, which I think has made it a lot stronger. 
Absolutely. And, and um, Comptroller Sue, back to you, sort of if we're successful, um, and there's a long way to go, mm -hmm. uh, the rule's not done, uh, I'm sure there will be uh, hundreds and hundreds of comments issued uh, on the NPR and, and a final rule to come. But if the rule is, is successful, if, uh, if, if we get CRA done in five years from now, 10 years from now, it's a success. What's going to look different uh, in in low and moderate in, income communities? Um, how is it, the nature of the banking relationship with communities going to change? Yeah, I think that's the right question to ask because you know we 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 want to be outcomes focused. We're not we're not doing this for the process. We're doing this for the outcome. Um, so the outcome we want is a fulfillment of the statute's mandate, right? Be, the banks meet the the credit needs. Uh, of the communities in which they operate, especially those of LMI communities. So what does that mean concretely? Well, at a really high level, you know, my expectation is that we're gonna see higher levels of CRA activity. Like the way the rule's been constructed, I think you're gonna see an overall rise in, in the level of activity. I think you're also gonna see better and more impactful activities. You know, Lael had referred to this. We, we, we make, we go to uh, special, uh, parts to incentivize, you know, um, uh, persistent poverty areas, small businesses, like extra small businesses, disaster preparedness, climate resiliency. Like those were specifically kind of crafted and targeted to ensure they don't kind of slip through the cracks, that those are, those are there. Um, and, and finally, like we want faster action. And I think that there have been some kind of referring back to the eligible activities. There were some complaints before, some of them, a lot of them found it that it just took too long. And I think that Part of this process here is that if we can have you know, overall more, better, and faster CRA activities, what you should see is that there's just this stronger feedback loop between communities and banks. So that through that mix of quantitative, qualitative, and that framework, you're getting more financial inclusion, more banking access, more small business development. You know, you go down the list, more affordable housing, more home ownership. Those are all the things that we're, we're striving for. Thank you. Vice Chairman Brainerd, same question. Uh, what, what do you hope will come out of this rule if we're successful? You're on mute, Lyle. Thank you. Um, so I'm hoping um, that when I travel around to communities uh, in different parts of the country, um, where I don't currently see banks investing in those communities, whether it be the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota or Hope, Mississippi, I'm hoping to see the new CRA approach providing incentives uh, to lead to greater banking services, greater credit to small businesses and greater community investments, all of which will make for more vibrant uh, communities. And, you know, we will, for the first time, have data to identify communities with low levels of community development financing, which would allow us to do an impact assessment of uh, what would the impact of community development investments in that area have. Um, we've also thought a lot about um, the uh, ways that community um, development activities are defined to make sure that you uh, provide CRA credit only when those activities do not displace or exclude low or moderate income residents from low and moderate income communities. That's been an important uh, area that we just haven't had a uh, strong enough uh, screen on. So we propose one. Um, we are trying to provide powerful incentives for investments in affordable housing in those communities, investments in climate resilience for the first time. Um, and so our hope is that those kinds of activities which haven't gotten credit in the past, by giving credit, you'll see more affordable housing, affordable housing that, that is in areas that does not displace, uh, but rather serves low and moderate income residents, Investments in climate resilience, for instance, which haven't previously uh, been um, given uh, consideration. These are the kinds of changes uh, that over time we would hope to see. Thank you. I'm gonna ask one more question because this was such a, um, such a process. And, and I feel as though through the process, 
I, I got to know each of you a little better, your values, your commitment to this issue. Um, you know, folks didn't always agree, but as as uh, Mike said earlier, um, coming together, you know, we're, we're, we're going farther together here. Could you talk a little bit about the process that got you here and, and how you hope it will transform the collaboration among the three agencies going forward? It, it occurs to me that this is not just about a rule, but really about how three agencies implement a rule and think about issues, um, you know, in the same way. Um, uh, what would you hope would come out of the interagency collaboration going forward? And I'll, I'll just see which of you would like to go first on this one. Mike. Uh, sure. So, I, so um, you know, the, the staffs of all three agencies, we each have extremely dedicated, extraordinarily dedicated staff. I mean, this, I think we knew this, I mean, I kind of knew this coming in, but seeing it up close and personal, it is amazing how much experience and how dedicated folks are to making this work. And sometimes those passions uh, uh, manifest in all sorts of ways. And I think the good news here is that there was a very strong desire to kind of achieve that shared objective of strengthening and modernizing the CRA. All the things that Leo mentioned that you know, we've been talking through here because um, it takes kind of bringing all the different experiences. You know, the OCC has a different set of experiences with CRA uh, than the Fed and the FDIC. And putting them together on the table and kind of working that out with all the different touch points we have with NCRC and others results in a better product. It's not easy uh, by any stretch. But I think one thing that I think going forward, what I'm hoping is that because of that collaboration, that will continue. And that should hopefully result in better consistency. You know, there's, there's a number of parts within uh, the rule that do, there's a lot of quantitative stuff. There's also a lot of qualitative stuff. And I know there's concerns about the discretion and judgment on some of those qualitative parts, but if we do it together, that does tend to lead to convergence and consistency where we can check each other um, on how we're doing that. And I think that that will improve you know, outcomes um, uh, and trust and transparency into the process so we get to those outcomes in a way that, that are sustainable and durable. Yeah, I'd certainly um, uh, echo um, the, that we're standing on the shoulders of our really outstanding expert staffs, um, but we're also uh, very much um, building a spirit of um, collaboration between the three agencies. You know, we worked uh, very hard to come to agreement on every element of this proposal. We also worked very hard to make sure that we had unanimity within each of the decision-making structures within each of our um, agencies. And I think that is going to make this rulemaking more resilient um, and, and stronger. And uh, in order to achieve consistency, we can't stop with uh, the final rule. I think what we learned as Mike was mentioning, it's very different to do CRA exams for a bank with literally hundreds of assessment areas than it is to do for a bank that is a community bank in rural areas. They're just very different uh, approaches, but we want the banks to be clear that we have the same expectations. And in order to make sure that we really go that last mile in ensuring consistency so the grading is on a level playing field, we're going to have to have the staffs of the three agencies working together through the implementation pro uh, process. Um, and of course, a big piece of this is making sure that um, to the extent we're relying on data, we have consistent data collections, we're sharing that data. So we've got a lot of work to do to implement in a consistent way. But I think uh, banks asked for consistency between the three agencies. And they asked for a lot more uh, quantitative metrics. Um, and they certainly get all of that clarity, certainty, and consistency across the agencies by virtue of us just taking the necessary time to really agree with each other and work through those differences. Absolutely. And, and uh, you certainly delivered on that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there will be a variety of opinions about it, but uh, really, really. Um, really strong uh, proposed rule and, and we look forward to engaging uh, on it. Um, 
during the comment period. I want to thank both of you. That's our time for this video. Um, we, we do have uh, Acting Chairman uh, Martin Grunberg will be speaking to the conference, and uh, members of the three banking agencies staffs will be discussing the rule in greater detail. I'm sure we could talk for another hour, but uh, we, we wanted to, to give each of you a chance to address the NCRC audience. So thank you once again uh, for your time, for your service, uh, Madam Vice mm -hmm. Chair and, and, and Acting Comptroller. Thanks so much, Jesse. Thank you. All right, so you got a chance to see Jesse after all. Okay, well, we had a, a bit of a change in our program, so we're going to um, shift a little bit. Um, but so a couple things I just want to remind you. I know I sound like a broken record, but I want to make sure that you all go to the stations outside and do what? All right, thank you. All right, well, before we go, I have just a few housekeeping things. Your next breakout session begins at 2.15. Um, so you should have a little bit of extra time when you leave here. I want to remind you to go to the App Store, download the Crown Compass app. And um, when you download the app, just look for the Just Economy Conference and it'll pop up for you. You should be able to use your email address um, that you registered with. Um, before our, um, uh, secondly, the floor maps you see behind me can also uh, help you find the app. There should be a QR code if you need assistance finding the app. And then we also have events on two levels, the concourse level, which is where we are now, and the terrace level above. So if you need any assistance getting around, you can look at the maps to get around. And then, of course, you can ask any of the staff that have on the pink staff, um, the pink staff ribbons. Don't forget to use hashtag Just Economy on social media. We will be looking for your pictures. You are able to also uh, go and tag your pictures and pick them up as a momentum, print them off, and tag your photos at the photo box in the concourse foyer. So there's a lot of cool stuff in the concourse foyer to make sure you take pictures. And then this is not the last reminder because before we leave, I'm going to remind you to do what? All right. Um, so, last reminder, after the next breakout session at 2.15, you'll be with me again, where I'll be uh, on a panel with the mayor from Birmingham, Alabama, talking about how they're using ARPA resources and how the town of Apex is also using our ARPA resources. So you'll be back here at 3.30. And then I just want to thank all of our luncheon speakers and our guests who were able to join us this afternoon. Thank you to all of you for participating. We are really excited that you're here. And I hope that you all are doing some great connecting. And I look forward to me meeting each of you as you move around the conference. So have a great rest of the afternoon and enjoy the time that we are gifting you back.